Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, just going to need just a sec while these guys get mic'd up. But certainly, you know, when I came, when they asked me to do this, I was thinking wearables and music. And I wasn't really getting it because, you know, when I think about wearables so far, I've thought a lot about, you know, things like Google Glass, things like watches. Um, but actually, music and wearables have a long history. You know, um, one, of the, one of the panelists has a speaker that he's going to show. And you know, it sort of occurred to me that you know, I remember another wearable music device that I used to attach to my belt you know, way back when. And you know, most of you aren't old enough, but a few of you are. You know, we, we had Walkmans. Uh, so the music and wearable space actually goes back a ways. And they're already, in some ways, ahead of some of these other spaces. And yet, at the same time, music and technology have had a few challenges, which I think we'll get into, that it hasn't always been easy in the music space to take a good idea and have it be a commercial success just because you've had that idea. So I'm really excited um, that we have a great group of people who have found ways to make business, music, and technology come together and get through some of these hurdles. And we can talk about where this is going, where some of the opportunities are, so while Brian's uh, getting getting mic'd up, maybe uh, you know, uh, Larry, Michael, do you want to start by maybe talking a little bit about your background and also just you know as you started to think about wearables and music, like what what are some of the initial thoughts that come to mind? Yeah. So um, you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah okay. So uh, it is hot in here, as you can tell. Um, so yeah, I'm with Vivo. I had product and tech for the company. And so I basically deal with everything from getting, I get labels, uh, record labels give us music videos on hard drives. We ingest them into the system. We encode them for all the various platforms. We build the apps. Uh, you know, it's, it's iOS, Android, web, um, Xbox, Roku, Apple TV, yada, yada. The list goes on and on. Uh, we're launching tonight in Germany. So I've got a few things on my mind uh, today because it's, uh, it's not quite ready. Um, but it will be by tonight. Um, so. Uh, what else? Uh, I used to be in MySpace for a while. I sold them a company. So I've done a lot of startups. Um, I'm a musician, so I've always been into music. Um, as I think about wearables, you know, I think we're just we're cl very clearly at the very beginning of this whole thing. And there's going to be a ton of roadkill on the way. And, and just having had a, an entrepreneurial background, I would just maybe caution some of the folks that are thinking, oh, I've got a great idea. Think beyond the idea. Think about how it becomes a sustainable business. Because there's going to be a ton of great ideas I mean, just ask like Jonathan Abrams, right? He had a great idea. Uh, so, so, I mean, you've got to think about those things. Think about the sustainability, not just the, the wow factor of t the today. And you also have to map that probably to the context of the device. Like right now, we're all thinking about you know, our glasses and our watches and the most obvious things. But there's going to be lots of other things that, um, that will emerge that we can imagine, our callers, whatever. There's, there's other formats. Right now, we're at the clunk phase where it's very discovery oriented. And I think there's going to be a long road, probably years, between here to there. So um, I'm, I think it's very interesting. I think there's lots of platforms that could be leveraged from today's operating systems in, in, into wearables. I mean, you, you look, at, look at what Chromecast is doing. I mean, that's a very interesting thing. You start to think about those kinds of things and how that can map into wearables. So we'll get into more stuff, but I don't want to keep talking when we got these guys. Sounds good, Larry. Do you want to? Sure. I'm at uh, Walden Venture Capital in San Francisco. We do sprout stage investing, which is post product or post technology. Doesn't necessarily need to have revenue, often it does, but it's something tangible. And the key to uh, the starting point of trying to figure out if an investment makes sense is a great demo. So I'm really looking for tangible things that are gonna generate a lot of visceral excitement when you actually see them. So if you have different ideas or different products, uh, Actually, if you have different ideas, I'm not actually that interested in the ideas. What I'm interested in is seeing that tangible product, and if you show me something, uh, that's really valuable to see. And I want to see something that feels like it really has great mass market potential, which means that it will ultimately end up working across very large installed bases of, of different devices as well. Uh, and I, you know, I think that's a little bit of a segue to the concept of the installed base. Uh, you know, I have a, a dead hardware museum in my office, which is just a bunch of different pieces of hardware. But what made them all great was the service that ran on them. And the exciting service or the game 
always took really you know, strong, unique advantage of the capabilities of whatever that platform actually is. And the, for each one of those systems that worked, there were dozens in front of that that didn't work. And very often, the service that works on a, the emerging winner was actually kind of functional and exciting on something that didn't really work all that well. So I think figuring out how to leverage an install base that exists is a very big deal. But the key is that guys like you have patience to find that space, right? That's the part that people don't necessarily understand. And you know, I want to dive into, once we get going, what's going to separate the roadkill from the ideas that make it. Um, but, um, let's Brian, get Brian in the mix. Brian's sir. joined us. And Brian also is uh, a little bit busy this week doing his own uh, SF Music Tech uh, yeah. event. Not or, SF New Tech, but SF yeah, Music Brian Tech. Yeah, I'm Brian just from the SF Music Tech Summit. Thank you, Reg. What does it say up there? That's Miles, not me. Anyway, we're tomorrow. Anyone who comes with a glazed badge gets half price. Larry Marcus is featured. Michael's featured. Michael's nine-piece Latin jazz band is playing tonight. Um, really, you know, it was really interesting because in the past, people would buy albums or whatever, and it would be like a piece of plastic that would only play in the room where it physically was with the physical player. And, you know, just like with the internet, you know, it's like, music really, distribution of music came first and followed by distribution of movies and all these other things because they're much bigger. But in a lot of ways, I mean, it's not as early as like porn or anything, but really music leads the way. And we've been really lucky in the music space because, you know, Walkman and even before that, the Bone Phone and now all sorts of other stuff, uh, you know, has been around a little while. So it's really good to look for stuff like, look towards stuff like music to see where these other things are going to, go and, well, there's and there's a big difference here between porn and music porn has a proven business model right so we'll get into we'll, we'll the get fact to that. that music hasn't always it's early when it comes yeah. to technology but lacks porn's sustained business model so, so it's been interesting because you know people have been listening to music for so long and now there are all these different applications popping up where people are playing music on, on wearable devices or I'm not gonna, you know, or, or, or having portable speakers that they're carrying around or, you know, we've got some great stuff tomorrow where people are having instruments built on Google Glass and it's really interesting because they're wonderful, you know, but you kind of have to listen to them yourself. Um, so it's really neat to see the bleeding edge of technology and trying to figure out where it's going to go is really fascinating because people can build great things, but unless there's the demand and the product market fit, it's not going to go anywhere. So what I'm hearing from, from all of you is there has to be a good idea, there has to be a decent sized market for it, or in your case, a really big market for it. What are some of the areas within uh, wearables? Where, where do you see music and wearables likely taking off first? What are some of the combinations of things that go on the body and music that you think are, are closer to being around the corner? Well, much like you can, you know, airplay from your iPhone to your TV, to your Apple TV, I'm sure you will be able to airplay from your iPhone to something else that you're wearing, maybe in your ear, right? That that kind of thing would make sense. Um, I, I think what we're going to find very early on is that the mobile phone is, is, is the anchor for lots of these things because there's so much already there established. And it's just going to be the, the, the notion of transferring that to the wearable. Well, and the processing power, the network yeah. connection, the battery are all going to be in that smartphone. It, it, it's a computer you're carrying around already. So I, I, that's a big question is, you know, folks with dedicated devices. Why, would, why do you carry multiple devices? I, well, I don't know. How many devices do you carry, Larry? A few. A few. But in reality, everybody carries a phone. So I think a lot will go towards that as the device. So I want to I disagree with that. Cool. Because. As it turns out, different devices really have different features and functions. And it's interesting, if you're in a car with multiple people in it, people might actually be uh, all using their phones for, you know, around the music. Like one person is, is DJing, another person, you know, is doing, uh, you know, they're sound hounding and watching the lyrics, or right. there's things that are happening on multiple devices. The thing about phones is they sound like crap, right? But they're amazing for music. And um, I've been carrying around this Boombot. I'm an investor, sorry for the uh, shameless promotion. Um, and 
you know, it's wearable because it has a clip. Okay. <laughs> Like, uh, like your Mac Portable is portable because they put portable in the because name. Because they put a handle on it. But what you end up finding is that you want to carry this around because suddenly your music is moving with you, you know, into the bathroom, outside, onto the deck, traveling to a hotel. And then it makes you start thinking about, well, you know, I actually like having this second device, but what if I was willing to pay a little more and all of a sudden I could put processing in here? Mm -hmm. and Things like biometric inputs from this uh, on a standalone basis can be really interesting. Other kinds of features and functions, but you know, if you have a camera in it, you know, and you're not particularly tall and you're at a concert, you know, you go like this and you're watching your phone. It's like a periscope. So the second devices really get interesting, and they I think will have much more input, you know, intelligence over time. I also think once the computers do, uh, once the phones do multitasking much better, we'll have a much better experience. Right now, it is limited. Yeah, but on the, the biometric input thing, you know, if you've tried to work out while you're listening to music, if the music is in tempo with your heartbeat, it ends up that that's also in tempo with your breathing rate, and um, you know that's something that. Uh, BioBeats, which is a part of you know the founder from Basis, created. It's about trying to sync up your sound to your heart rate, and it's amazing when you when you match the tempos. You can actually try it, you know, with some different apps as well. You know, picking songs that are in the right tempo, and uh, you know it really affects your mood. So I think biometrics inputs affecting your media is really going to you know, do some interesting things. I mean, why say what playlist you want to listen to? Why can't I just feel you and then generate that? So one of the areas, it seems like, is this intersection of exercise and music and technology. Are there other areas that you see as particularly uh, ripe for innovation early on? It sounds like playing music is another one. Uh, somebody mentioned there's some pants that you can play drums on. I think you were saying you'd rather have that if you're going to play drums on your stomach. Yeah, I, I'm the chest guy. My, yeah. the, the kick drum is here. See that? I think it's a little higher. It's kick and <laughs> snare is down here. OK. So yeah, I need the, I need the shirt. OK. Um, but do we see the performance of music as, I mean, that's not a, in Larry's world, that's not a mass market, right? Or are there enough musicians to make that count? I mean, look, that, that's kind of niche, even among musicians, right? We're like, it's uh, Blue Man Group. You know? Yeah, right, right. It's been, what, what, 10 years in the running now? That's right. That's one band. So it, what? It, it's been really hard to get new instruments that people really like. For whatever reason, I mean, there's some great folks like Roger Lynn who invented the drum machine, who have some great papers on, you know, why a piano is this wide, because, you know, you need the hammer for each string. So it seems like there would be, there would be movement towards new instruments, but folks, there's a real tradition of you learn the piano or you learn the guitar, and even though there are these other great instruments coming out, you know, there will always be some people who are kind of the unique performers who play them, but the question is, what will it take for any of these to get real uptake? Yeah. I mean, the wearable is a very broad category, and... Um, yeah, the keytar, that's wearable. That's right. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you add another screen, like with Google Glass, you've got another major opportunity to deliver different kinds of experiences uh, that also relate to your music. So I think you're going to see some very exciting things you know, coming out pretty soon that will you know, leverage that sort of capability. Uh, you also have different portions of this platform that really haven't been vetted out. And when somebody really gets creative, and they're delivering a joyful experience that you've never had before because of the intersection of the unique capabilities, that's gonna be kind of that Mario Brothers, right, for Nintendo, the Halo for the Xbox, the thing that makes it really work. So I think that the hardware side of this is just very uninteresting. You know, it's the services that, that deliver that, those services uh, will transition. So I'm curious, how much do you get, and you all have experience in, in the technology field of dealing with music, music licensing, the challenges that the rights play in all this. 
have those been sorted out through where we are now, or do you think we're likely to see the, the intersection of the musicians' rights and the labels and all that again rear its head? You know, I think of, you know, what's the line between personal performance and a musical performance? You know, some of those sure. things coming up. If you have a speaker and you're broadcasting, um, is this clean territory, or are we likely to have to reinvent the wheel? I don't it's, oh, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say, I don't think it's sorted out at all. Um, having been in music and in tech. Nor will it ever be. Right. It's one of those things like, <laughs> but the, 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 the music people are generally f way further behind, and they always will be. So they're not thinking about this stuff like the way we're thinking about it right now. So it will catch somebody by surprise, no doubt. Yeah. Um, but make no mistake, in due time, although it will be a long time, in due time, if it drives a royalty check, it'll happen. Yeah, I mean, it's a little complicated because there's such a clusterfuck around licensing. Um, but a lot of folks... Uh, That's a the, technical industry term, but you guys on, get it. On, right? on the internet, you can almost fly under it in some cases because, you know, if you're small and no one notices you, and blah, blah, blah. But if you're building hardware, I mean, you're clearly big enough for them to go after you. So a lot of folks, I mean, it, what it will mostly have an effect on, I think, is limiting what you can do in some cases. Because so for instance, the difference between a private performance and a public performance it, it means different rights. So for instance, if you have something like an external speaker that hooks up to your regular, your regular source, that's clear because you don't need to buy, you don't need to get a license to have an external speaker on anything, clearly. However, if you have a fully integrated system that is designed to play music out loud, you've got some issues. So you may end up with situations where someone like Apple may, or, or anyone may really want to do something, but they can't do it as one integrated company. They really need to do it up to a certain point. No, it's the, the jack is meant for headphones, that's private. And then have someone else who does the, you know, and then you probably have, you know, I don't want to give any of the music industry lawyers any ideas, but you know, if all of a sudden it's like, Oh no, they're totally separate, but wait a minute, no, that's Apple's, you know, iPhone and Apple's speakers and they're sold together and oh my God, it's a public performance. So uh, that term I used uh, earlier is quite apt and it will be a mess for a long time. I was going to say avoid music licensing. Uh, you know, if you're an early stage company, you just can't do it. It's not fundable. And this comes from someone who helped start Pandora, so you guys know a thing or two about Right. And those music. weren't, the, Pandora's not using direct licensing deals. That, that would have been a non-starter in the business. It's a statutory license, so there is no separate negotiations. And I, I haven't done any deals. I've done a, a bunch of, of different music-related companies uh, because music is, is an area that's so crucial. You know, everybody loves music. It's a question of to what extent. All the major companies in the world use music licensing as a lost leader to sell their devices or, or other services. But it's really, if you can create, I keep using this word joy, but it's an important one, a lot of joy around your experience that's related to music, it helps you open up other gateways to other kinds of revenue streams besides of selling music. So if you guys were gonna create or invest in, in some startups in music, where do you think the opportunities are right now? Where, where should people be building companies around music and wearables? Well, you've had already invested in a few, so. Right, I mean, I have a bunch um, that are you know, pretty early stage. Uh, you know, I'd say around the wearable space per se, I almost you know, put it back on you, which is, show me the thing that I should invest in, and I'm willing to have a lot of creativity around seeing how to bring it to the mass market, but it's so hard to actually develop something that's really compelling. You know, step back from the hype and actually look at a demo and see if it wows you, and uh, actually it actually doesn't happen all that often. So if you have something that's like that, uh, that that's a very exciting starting point uh, to really build from. So, so, but Larry, so, Let's say, you know, entrepreneur comes to you, great idea, great demo, you give them 300 grand to go work on it, they get it to the next level. What's, I mean, is that enough room and runway for this whole world to catch up with that, to make it a meaningful enterprise? How do you deal with that? Right, so I actually find that the seed rounds are relatively easy to raise. Yeah. And I've done a bunch of uh, individual seed investments 
Um, and you know, I'd say that's probably the, the fastest, easiest money you'll ever raise. And if you're having trouble raising seed money, then you know, that's probably not a great indicator. But let's say you've had that. That money is now crucial to get to that key next step that I'm using the word sprout. You know, it's turned into something that's tangible. At that stage, I find there's a certain magic in kind of the one to four million dollar round. Um, you know, most typically uh, a million and a half or two million dollars, which is enough time for a very strong group to both recruit and make great progress over the next 18 months. So I think it's all about the next, call it 12 month window of what you're gonna do. It's actually kind of a short term business. I'm trying to fund plans that look like they're gonna kick ass and really build value in 12 months so we can go out and raise more money and then we'll participate, we'll join in, but our typical check size is probably uh, a couple million dollars. So Brian and Michael, let's get specific. I mean, what are, so, what are some music ideas you'd like so, to so, see? So quick question, is a phone considered wearable device? If you get one of those really cool holsters. No, I mean, I think definitely. Yes. Be because, because for me, what I'm seeing so much is around the live experience these days and around electronic music and around kids going to Beyond Wonderland with 40,000 people or Electric Daisy with 115,000 people. And you can really get lost in that. So which of your friends are going? How do you meet the people you'll have fun with? How do you connect with people? So much of this is really about connecting with people around music. And those are the ones, if you drive people to, you know, to go to particular shows, you know, a company like Jukely, that Larry got in, I just got in on. You know, if you get these folks who like, help you connect once you've been, been in the show, if they help people hook up, if they help people find new friends, there will always be money for that. If you help drive commerce around music, and unfortunately these days, masters aren't, you know, people aren't buying as much music, but they're spending tons of music to go to shows. You've got Vegas now where they're kind of switching their whole model. Enough with this gambling. I don't go to, I don't go to throw away money at the table, but people go to see conferences. They go to see Tiesto, they go to see Avicii. So how do you drive commerce towards music or, or around music by connecting people through the devices? And that's where I think a lot is gonna happen. How do you sell experiences around music? How do you sell experiences? How do you like get band people- band page experience, it's about, you know, getting in early to a show, spending time with the band, going for a run with them, biking with them, yeah. being a part of the song, being a part of the video. Yeah, you enter a contest and you get a text and oh my God, pop backstage and meet the band. I mean, it's like, really, if, if people can have a great time around music through their devices, that's, that's where it's at, I think. Fellas, they can do this stuff with their mobiles today. So I mean, what's, what's a wearable instance of this Nirvana and that's, music? And that's the point, is we are on this continuum yeah. where 40 years ago there was nothing, and now there's a bunch, but where does it end up or, going? Or do we think, and, and I think that this may be the case, I mean, you talked about this in other platforms, Pandora, Pandora started on the PC waiting for basically the phone to exist. When the phone existed, it was sort of an aha moment. Are the great wearable music companies going to exist on phones first, and then once there's a decent wearable platform, then we'll see them come to life? Probably. Yeah, I mean, when, when the Sprint clamshell phone came out, uh, we ported Pandora onto that phone, and it would have to be open to play, and then you'd have to take an adapter to actually get it to a quarter inch, and then you need to carve with a quarter inch input. I actually had a cassette tape I didn't have a, a car with a quarter inch input yet. I used a cassette tape adapter, plugged that into another adapter, and then when the clamshell sat in the cup holder, it would fall out if you made a turn. <laughs> and then it was over like a 0.1G network. But it still was amazing to hear it in the car. Few different phones, few iterations, it was in position figuring out how to do that. When the iPhone shipped, it was really ready. So, so that's the service being ready for some of these platforms. And I think the big challenge is make your service. How do you make it work on as big of a platform as you can today to show that it really works to be in position? So we only have about a minute left, I'm being told, but what's, what, who's going to bet big on this and fail? What's going to be the most spectacular flame out? What's your predictions on you know, which, which big player out there is going to you know, bet big and, and, and not, not make a go of this wearable thing? I think every big hardware company, every CE company will try big pieces of this. And 
they're probably not going to work all that well. And that those are, there is going to be a ton of flame outs. There could be dozens of different devices that uh, you know, literally just are kind of DOA or have very small niche markets. Those will then turn into something interesting. I want to be seeing what's making those devices really work that's unique, not just you know, you're filming a play and calling it a movie. I think the companies that focus on proprietary stuff, those are the ones that will flame out because we need leverage. The entrepreneurs that need leverage to get started, we need platforms, we need ecosystems. We have that with iOS, we have that with Android, right? We have that in other marketplaces as well. We need that level of support. We don't need another, a completely different ecosystem to spread it because that's going to need all kinds of critical mass and have to solve all kinds of other problems that these other platforms have already figured out. I mean, there are a bunch of these huge folks who are clearly going to go in this direction and look at it, whether it's you know Apple or Samsung or Qualcomm. And the folks who are going to work are the ones who have these little skunk work teams of three or four people who take the resources and the distribution and find something that really, really works. This is not going to be designed by committee. It's going to be designed by one rock star developer or three other guys who are really running but have the resources behind them to go with it. And it's really going to take a visionary CEO to fund and allow these folks to really move forward and screw all the, you know, it's my area, I'm in charge of blah, 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 you know, and really let these guys run independently as part of the large organization. That's what I think is going to do it. Well, I'd love to keep the discussion going, but uh, we've got to make way for the next panel. But thank you, thank you guys so much. Thanks, everyone. Good. Thank you. Thanks.